Throughout history, war has destroyed many of the greatest achievements of civilization. Bombs fell like rain on the great cities of Europe in the Second World War, and many wonderful structures were reduced to rubble. It was the same in Roman times. The barbarian invasions left city after city in ruin. Yet in spite of the incredible devastation, some structures miraculously survived. In Europe, it was often the great cathedrals with their vaulted roofs and domes. In the Roman Empire, it was often the arched bridges and viaducts. This is no mystical event or coincidence. It is a direct consequence of the structural design of the buildings and bridges themselves. It is a consequence of the unique properties of the arch. I suppose when most of us think of arches, we conjure up visions of those great Roman viaducts and bridges. But the arch isn't actually a Roman invention at all. It apparently comes from the cradle of civilization itself, ancient Mesopotamia. That's the land near the Persian Gulf that's now part Iraq, part Iran. And that the arch should begin its history there is in fact ironic because arches seem to be most useful in those lands that don't have stone available in big enough pieces to span large spaces. And yet there was such stone in Mesopotamia. The land was rich in beautiful great lumps of granite. But there was a set of materials that was more abundant and much easier to use than stone. And that is mud, straw, and camel dung. You can make marvelous mud bricks out of that kind of material. At first, people just dried the bricks in the sun. Later, they learned to fire them, making a much stronger brick. But either way, it was very easy to make the bricks anywhere in that part of the world. But why would anyone invent the arch in the first place? I mean, straight lines seem much easier to work with than curved ones. So why would anyone go to all the trouble of making such complicated curved structures? Well, even without knowing the why, people could see some key things about an arch. Essentially, it's a system which distributes its loads through compression, pushing, just as do the walls and beams which we have already seen. However, the arch is a much more sensible way of using compression because unlike a beam on top of a pair of posts, the arch can send the loads on it through a gentle curve to the ground. There are no sudden changes in direction of the thrust line. That's why the arch form is so common in nature and not just in natural rock formations either, though they are both spectacular and beautiful, but in living systems as well. There is a reason why the arch is so strong. Think of an arch the way the ancient Egyptians did. They made two straight walls and curved them so they met whilst the mortar was still soft. Sort of the world's first do-it-yourself arch. If the walls were straight and were merely tipped together, we'd have made a simple triangle. As we know, a triangular shape resists deformation. Well, the arch shares that property, but here's the difference. The triangle is strongest at its apex. If there is a load on one of the members at the side, the member itself can deform like a beam that is loaded. The same is not true for an arch. It's equally strong all the way round, not just at the top. And many people believe the keystone is the strongest point, but that is not the case. It's simply the last stone to be put in. Any load anywhere on the arch is carried by the curved shape to the ground.
A question arises. What is the most efficient shape for an arch? Early ones were semicircular and thick, but arches can also be very thin. Well, if you look at a suspended cable, you can see that it's just an arch upside down. It's a sort of parabola called a catenary, the most efficient shape for a freestanding arch. But the exact shape of the curve will depend on the load the arch will be supporting, and this is known as its funicular curve. We can actually find the best shape for an arch by looking at the principle of the suspension bridge. Here are some bandages that have been smothered in plaster of Paris. Actually, they're the same ones that are used for making a cast for a broken leg. Now, what I'm going to do is dip them in this water and then hang them up and see them take their natural shape. I'm going to pin them up with these pins alongside the ones that I've already put up there. If I let them hang by themselves with no other loads on them, they'll take up these natural shapes. Now, if I were to add a weight in the form of another bandage, the shapes will be different. Just dip them in the water. Use some paper clips this time, and perhaps a, a peg or two. Now that different shape is because the load is in a different place. Let's add some more. Now, if we let them dry, we can freeze these shapes into a pretty sturdy structure. OK, well, it's been a number of hours now. Let's see what we've got. Hmm. Well, I'm going to take this down and turn it upside down. And obviously, I'm going to need another pair of hands, which will be supplied by a member of the video crew. Let's see what we can do. OK, if you, if you take those two, Marit, yep. That's that one there. This one here. Out you come. Right. Now, whoops. Okay, down we go. Over the top. That's it. Let's see what we've got. Down gently. Whoops. Great. Thanks, Mario. So there we are. There's a series of funicular shaped arches, uh, they're very thin and they're quite strong. The only problem is that this whole shape is for one pattern of loading only. So, if you want to make a series of arches that are very thin, one has to get the shape right in the first place if there isn't any room for a wandering thrust line. But what happens if we have a load on the top that there is? Say you want the arch to support a roadway. Before the traffic arrives, the thrust line for the unloaded arch is this. What we really want when there is a load on the bridge is an arch that would take a thrust line like this. So this arch is inappropriate to this situation, but you can only build an arch in one shape. So how can you build one that will work for different loadings? Well, all you really have to do is make the original arch thicker then these thrust lines, the lines the loads take to get to the ground, could still be contained within the shape of the arch. It means you have to use a lot more material, but it works. Because if we don't and the load on top becomes too large, the arch could break at the haunches. That is why most simple arches are thicker at the places where they need to be. The Romans knew this very well which is why their arches, although not considered very elegant, have nevertheless stood the test of time.
Making an arch thick in all the right places has had some very important consequences. Consequences that have not been lost on the retreating armies of the world. When in retreat, most armies destroy the bridges they cross over. That makes it more difficult for those chasing them. But arched bridges have proved very difficult to make collapse. You see, if you only put your explosives at the obvious place in the middle, where the arch is usually the thinnest, a small portion may be blown out, but then, just like a triangle, the two sides meet again and support each other. It may not leave a smooth road on the top, but it won't slow a pursuing army very much. In fact, if you put your dynamite anywhere along the top of the bridge at only one point, you get the same result. It's as stable as a triangle. In an earlier program, we saw that with a triangle, the three joints can actually be hinged, and you still have a stable structure. It's only when you get four hinges or more that a structure becomes very unstable. Well, the same is true with an arch. To make it collapse, you have to break it simultaneously in at least two other places besides the feet. That means we would have to put the explosives deep in the thickest part of the arch and use more dynamite. Well, not all retreating armies had time to blow the arch bridges as successfully as they did this one. And that's why so many have survived over time. The arch, in spite of its origins thousands of years ago, is still a major form in architecture today. And there are three major kinds. There are monolithic arches, which look like this. They are arches that are usually cast in one piece and firmly planted in the ground. They are consequently quite thick at the two ends and thinnest at the top. Then there are what we call two-pinned arches. They are thin at the two ends and are literally hinged at their feet, which are connected to separate footings. The thickest part is at the top. And finally, you've got the three-pin situation hinged at the footings and made in two pieces, joined at the top. In large arches, this permits expansion and contraction. And it's amazing to realize that this arch, even though it has three flexible joints, is still very strong. Once again, it's the principle of the triangle at work. There are examples of arches in every community. We see them in both bridges and buildings. And the kind of arch we build depends on what it will have to do. Now, one thing that's common to all arches is that they all want to push outwards. A steeper arch pushes out less than a shallow one. That's fairly easy to imagine. You see, the shallow arch directs the force from the loads outwards more than straight down. But even a steep arch is pushing out to some extent. So how do you contend with it? Two ways, push or pull. You can have direct resistance with big buttresses, but that uses a lot of material and takes up space. Alternatively, you could tie the arch across the bottom. It could be a cable or even a lightweight footbridge, but that's no good, of course, if you need headroom for boats passing under it. So the way you do it has to be appropriate to the situation. This is the Glen Canyon Bridge over the Colorado River. It demonstrates another thing to think about when designing arches. You see, strong winds hitting the side of an arch can affect its stability. There are many ways around the problem, but the most elegant solution involves removing as much material as possible from the areas that aren't doing work, just like the truss. This allows the wind to blow through the arch rather than blow it over. Well, that's just fine for bridges, but the trouble with arches Marvellous though they are for making openings, is that they don't provide you very much cover. So you can stand under an arch, but it hardly encloses very much space. So how could you make one do so? Well, what you could do is to extrude an arch, just keeping the curve like toothpaste from a tube, only making it much longer. And when you do that, what you've made is what we call a barrel vault. 
barrel vault has all the properties the original arch has, plus a few other added bonuses. First of all, it spreads some of the load sideways, just as a wall spreads its load along a footing. In other words, it doesn't just take it down to a point. And the second thing about it that's neat is that it's stable in all directions. You can't push a barrel vault over. Of course, nothing comes for free. The problem with the barrel vault is that just like the arch, it produces outward thrust. With arches, we can tie them together across the bottom using cables in tension, but it doesn't work with a barrel vault because we'd have to tie it across at so many points. So a barrel vault pretty well has to be buttressed. That was really the snag because of the amount of material needed and the amount of space it would take up. You could put two vaults side by side to counteract each other's outward thrust, but when we get to the end, the problem is still there, and therefore, so are the buttresses. Well, that's all very logical, and there are great vaulted roofs all over the world that use the principle of the barrel vault. But there are lots of other things that you can do, based on the vault concept, that make beautiful and functional structures. For example, Suppose we were to join four barrel vaults with each one at right angles to the other. If we do, we can see that each end makes a mitre or 45 degree connection with all the others and we get what's called a groin vault. If you cut these parts of the barrel vaults back, you end up with something like this. And what's neat about this idea is that now you can use tension to deal with the outward thrust. You see, you can tie what remains of the vaults around their bottom edges because the loads now come down to just four points. There are many examples in most communities. Of course, you don't have to stop with four when it comes to intersecting barrel vaults. We can do it with several at smaller angles to each other. And a series of groin vaults can be grouped together to cover quite large spaces. Now let's look again at the four intersecting barrel vaults. What if we were to use the parts of the barrel vaults that are missing? If we do so, we can create what is called a cloister vault. Now, this kind of vault can't be held together with ties, but if it is formed from a number of intersecting barrel vaults, it begins to look like a dome. In fact, it's called a cloister dome. Then you can use tension to hold it all together. All you have to do is drop a hoop over it, just like a hoop over a barrel. one interesting anomaly in all of these vault designs. It's called the fan vault, and it's possibly the most beautiful. This is one of the finest examples in North America, and it's here in the National Gallery in Ottawa. This fan vault has been very carefully reconstructed in the new gallery, having been saved from the Rideau Street convent that was torn down to make way for a parking lot for a commercial building. Instead of starting with arched barrel vaults and eventually getting down to a set of supporting pillars, the fan vault starts with a set of pillars and spreads the tops of them like an ice cream cone. In other words, supposing you had half an arch going straight down to the ground and you rotated it in a full circle, you get a fan vault. Take several of these in a couple of rows and you can enclose a whole space. It's interesting because it's doubly curved. It's got a concave curve there and a convex one there. Of course, you can't make a perfect join with several circles. There's always a hole that you have to fill in, and that is not easy. Architects have gone to great lengths to get that bit to hold up without falling into the floor below. As a result, this kind of vault is more decorative than structural and is usually built underneath an existing roof. They are, however, extremely elegant. There are many buildings that use combinations of vaults and arches. For example, you might have several groin vaults, supported with barrel vaults and buttresses at the sides and so on. So when you come across ceilings like these, you'll be able to tell exactly what kind of vaults they are. 
and you'll be surprised where you might find them too. This one, for instance, is the ceiling for a train station, and it's made using bricks. So the vault uses the principle of the arch in three dimensions to enclose space and it does it very well. But in spite of the fact that we could combine several vaults to make something that was more or less round, the vault is essentially a linear structure. So would it be possible to actually make a circular vault from the arch and would it be of any use? Well the answer is yes. You see, you can consider the vault as a sort of arch that's been extruded. Now, we could also enclose space if we took an arch and rotated it about its vertical middle. And that's exactly what a dome is. It's an infinite series of concentric thin arches. And so the dome has all the properties of the arch, and for that matter, a barrel vault. For instance, the dome is stable. You can't knock it over. And since each of the thin arches takes a part of the load, the forces will be spread over the entire surface. Consequently, the dome can be quite thin. But it does inherit some of the problems of an arch too. Now, I want to show you something that's very interesting about domes in general. I've taken an orange and I've cut it in half, eaten all the good stuff in the middle, and what I'm left with is a dome of orange skin. Now, if I push down on the top, look what happens. It wrinkles up at the top, but it splits along the bottom edge. And what's interesting about that is that if it scrunches up at the top, but stretches and splits around the bottom, that means that somewhere in between, there must be a point where it's neither in compression nor tension. So, just like the neutral axis for a loaded beam, a dome has one too. We call it the transition line. And above it, all the circumferential stresses are in compression, below in tension. And that means that we can make a hole in the dome, like a window for instance, at the transition line, and it won't weaken it in any way. That's why many domes have rings of windows part way up. This example is the famous Hagia Sophia, Church of the Holy Wisdom in Istanbul. In ancient times, when they didn't know how to deal with tension, people made their domes so that they only used the portion of the dome above the transition line, the part in compression only. Very clever. Incidentally, patrons were very highly regarded in those days, at least by themselves. A mosaic in the church depicts the Emperor Justinian holding a model of the church and standing at the right hand of God. What is also interesting is that you can actually make a hole in the top of a dome and it won't collapse. Just think of the hole as a circular arch lying on its side. It resists any forces pushing in on it, just as any arch does. And this is called a compression ring. The Pantheon in Rome is the most famous example of this. There are others. In Canada, this is used to advantage whilst building an igloo. It's a dome made of snow. And as the blocks are added to the sides, you end up with a hole in the top, which can be left open to let smoke out. The hole is possible because the snow blocks surrounding it act just like a compression ring. Now, one snag with domes is that they're round. They're great for churches and perfect for the igloo, which couldn't be made any other way. But because of the uniqueness of a circular plan, they may not always make for efficient use of the space below them. But there is a way out of this dilemma. You can take a dome and slice it off at the sides and the top. Then add a smaller dome and sit the structure on a square plan, forming arches at the sides. 
You see, the smaller dome increases the height and helps reduce the outward thrust. We call this a pendentive. It's the essence of the domed roofs to Hagia Sophia. It's a system where we use the structural efficiency of the dome, but it's not dictating the shape of the space you want to cover. There are many others. These, for instance, form the ceiling to a bank in downtown Toronto. Now, you may have noticed that I haven't given you very many examples of domes found in nature, and there's a very good reason for that. In spite of all we've said, the dome is not the most efficient shape for a curved three-dimensional structure. It is, in fact, a human compromise uh, between the best shape and the abilities of people and the materials they have available to make such a shape work. Even the human head, which for those with little hair has been derisively called the chrome dome, isn't just a dome. It's a special kind of dome-like structure that we call the shell. So next time, we will explore the territory that nature has charted for us in developing the most perfect shapes for enclosing space, whilst using structures with great strength, but using the least amount of material. Right, Cecil? I told you to stop smoking, didn't I?